Uh, wait a minute. Just connecting. So we're just waiting. We're just a little bit early. We're one minute early. We're just getting in there, Kate and I, and you're all coming in. I can start to see you're joining the session. You've left the booths or we're going to wait for everyone to come out of um, either the arena or the social lounge. And it's lovely to see. I see Becky's put a photo on. Um, so, so it's nice to see faces if you want to do that. If you're going to join us all day, I would love to see um, who you, wh what you look like because I can see you are on a grid for me I can see who else is joining us so this is lovely we've got 15 so far Kate um, Gail's joining us okay well a little bit longer um, all this is recorded and the recordings will be made available and we're going to be asking for donations to our three charities the theme if you've missed it from the beginning is really Oh, well, a through line is diversity and agency. So all these women will have that in common, that they're all diverse and they're all showing up to help horse welfare and, and, and are changing animals' lives and horses' lives. Um, right, we're dead on time. Um, I want to sort of really give Kate the warmest of welcomes. She is totally connected to the last presenter, speaker, which was Christina. Um, Kate's smiling because she's actually on this fantastic, um, uh, is it, what's it called when you work for a short period of time? What, where are yeah, you? you were, short contract yeah yeah well it, you're working at the uh, un, uh at a university so you've managed to um rent out christina's gorgeous cottage so christina who just was presenting is literally what i don't know 500 meters away maybe a bit more a thousand yeah maybe away. a bit more up the hill yeah up the yeah. hill okay <laughs> I, I, I need a little island, don't I? So apologies for my ignorance. Oh, of course she's up the hill. Kate, warm, <laughs> welcome, warm welcome to our first ever International Women's Day. It wouldn't be uh, International Women's Day without you here presenting. So thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us. Kate's bio is all in the speakers. Um, we've got the chat going again. One of the things that I'm excited about in this next 45 minutes is I've really only met Kate once in person and that was at the ISIS conference in Rome and she blew me away with her human skills and being able to get the best beautiful interviews throughout the whole of the conference and I've really thoroughly enjoy your lens Kate so thank you for all you do for horses. I want to ask for everyone watching who might also be like me who know you or know your work, your research but don't know you. So can you just tell us your story? Yeah, okay. So I, I, I'm i Australian, but I lived overseas for about 18 years. And I spent a lot of time um, in, in the UK, in the US, um, Hong Kong and Singapore, mostly. And I rode in all those countries and I trained horses in all those countries. And anyway, Singapore, when I was in Singapore, I was riding in a Rolex International and um, just dressage. I wasn't, you know, anything hugely high level or anything. But my horse was so tense. You know? um, and I remember my instructor screaming at me as I was leaving the warm up arena, going, pick him up, hold him together. You know? <laughs> oh my God. Anyway, I won the class, which was crazy because the horse was so tense. And I just, I left there and I thought there's got to be a better way because, you know, it, it's fun to win the class, but this is not fun and this can't possibly be fun for my horse. And as it happened the following week, um, we were moving to the States. And so I thought, well, there's a lot of trainers in the States. I'll, I'll study with somebody. And I started investigating who that might be. Um, and I had come from, you know, sort of, dressage, I played polo, I, you know, did a lot of different things. So I didn't really care about the discipline particularly. And I looked around and to be honest, it's all men, really, um, top horse trainers are all men. Um, and a lot of them were, were way too sort of strict German dressage 
writing types. Um, that didn't appeal to me. Um, then there were a lot that were doing sort of really fluffy stuff um, that involved a lot of harmony and stuff that I couldn't really define. Um, and then I came across John Lyons, who was talking about conditioned response training. I thought, oh, well, that's not very sexy, but I can understand that. That actually makes some sense to me. And this was back, you know, the turn of the century, some time ago. He was quite ahead of his time talking about that sort of stuff. And so I went there and I spent eight months in Colorado studying with him, and I thought, that, that's great. And I then went back to the UK and um, started taking horses into training, and that's a lot of fun because you get these horses and people go, oh, this horse is a lunatic. And you say, oh, give it to me for a few weeks and I'll turn around. And you do. And they go, oh, that's lovely. I love it. Um, however, they then ring you up in a week or a month or six months and say, oh, this horse has started bucking again or the horse is, you know, behaving really badly. You know, you didn't do a very good job. Oh, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder why that is. Maybe it's the horse isn't a computer. And we can't simply install new software. Or maybe the horse isn't a machine. Um, so I decided really that there wasn't the way forward. And the way forward was to teach people to train their own horses. So I then moved mm. back to Australia and I sort of was, yeah, hey, of course. Come on. So I just while you were talking, I, I I sort of try and do this a little bit and um yeah. and we've we've done a lovely um ask the expert in coffee with horse lovers, and you sort of know that I react go to people's comments and i try and keep everyone engaged one of the things i've just done is i've asked a question shall we discuss that gender gap or gender difference in horse trainers and the polls in 75 percent have said yes of the delegates and obviously that tells me that there's something we could discuss i thought you really i thought the way you shared the um the fact that there is this inequality of gender. And what I mean by inequality is there's not 50, 50, 50 of men and women training horses, as in for you to go and train with. So I wonder if we want to just explore that a little. And I know you've got loads of experience about this and why I think you're so important to horse welfare and, and change that we're in right now. Can you sort of, can we expand it? Can we just dig in a bit yeah. more? Well, yeah, it is interesting. I mean, a decade ago, uh, Charles Sturt University invited me down to teach a weekend um, breaking in clinic. And I said to the course coordinator when I left, I said, well, why did you choose me? So I hadn't been back in the country that long. And he said, oh, I wanted a woman. And, you know, that was actually the first time I'd ever heard that. That was really interesting to me. The thing is, you know, we if you look at the statistics of the number of women that ride compared to the number of men that ride, mm -hmm. it's about 80% women, certainly in the um, leisure riding, pleasure horse industry, not in the top levels of competition, but they're the real minority across everything anyway. But most of, you know, the grassroots horses are owned by women and they're ridden by women and most of the trainers are men. And the, I think we approach things differently in life generally. Um, and I think as a woman, I know that I can't outmuscle a horse ever. Whatever it wants to do, it will do. It doesn't matter if it's a Shetland or a 17 hand thoroughbred, you know, it will still do what it wants to do. Uh, so the only bit I'm interested in training is the bit between the ears. And, mm. and I have to take That's a different so approach. I mean, is that interesting for every one of you watching and listening? The fact that because we don't our, our strength is probably what well, has always been between our ears as like that's our gender strength so you know we know that if you ask um how intelligent is a frog um and you test the frog by asking the frog to climb the tree you're not gonna get an accurate idea of what we're capable of and i just really like the fact that you have looked at what your strengths are and then put that spotlight on how you show up for horse training and I think that makes you really unique and I just want to just open this up as a chat so let's just think about how if what you've just told us is that you know we there are more women having relationships and I'm going to say relationships with horses whereas we did put a glance towards men and having 
uh, performance um, spotlight. But the, the leisure horse lover is predominantly female. Now, we do have data on that. That's fact. Yeah. So we've got a connection and a an a internal motivation to have relationship with horses. Why then would we choose to go to male trainers? It's really interesting. Do you th like that's a fascinating? That's it a is. survey you can do, Lisa. I think. Okay. Well, why don't we? Why don't we just cause all, <laughs> all do is yes and no. But why? Because that's the limitation <laughs> of software. Let's do some chat. Let's get some chat going. Because one of the things that we, I didn't know if this conference wanted to break out into, into uh, onto social lounge. And, but can we get some chat going about why would, do we choose? And I think there might be this construct of braving and that maybe men are braver or, or like I, what I'm trying to get at is why men? And you've, you've actually signposted us to physicality and the fact that Perhaps if we're choosing a man anyway, why would we want to either be more physical or you mentioned the word, um, the sort of uh, the very dominant uh, training system. And, you know, it's this whole we will have this transaction with our horses. Now, the climate sh changed, hasn't it? The whole we it we're shit. Well, yeah, it has, but has it changed enough? I mean, it's quite interesting. I still find people that, you know, I've been teaching for, for quite a long time that will come up against a problem with their horse and they'll say, oh, maybe I should just send it out to the trainer to ride through it and then mean the bloke down the road. Um, and I'm like, oh, you know, do you really think that's going to help you? I'm like, I don't think wet saddlecloth days are the answer. <laughs> Hey, I've just had this thought. It's brilliant. Thank you for sharing that story. I've just had this thought of, you know, we are good at reflection, like as in innovism. And I wonder if there is this whole, are we enough to train horses? So if we're doubting ourselves because we're the ones doing the reflection, do we then think, oh, well, therefore they'll go down the road to the man, like the man down the road because we're not enough? Is that is that something that you've thought of? Or c can we open this up? Here we go. We've got some conversations happening. Do you want me to read them out, Kate? Would that be good? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, instead of making it a gender discussion or what gender. Um, and how we we work, we, we ebb and flow between our masculine and feminine sides. So thank you, Jasmine. I think, can we pause that for now? I also think, um, if I also think yeah, for Jasmine though, um, it, is, it is a really good point and that we haven't done really any much work on the difference in how horses behave with the different sexes or with the different genders. We haven't done any work on gender really at all. But uh, published paper, recently published um, just this year actually, looked at the difference in the behaviour of a horse with the sex of the handler and rider. And one thing they found was that horses are more likely to be difficult to catch if a male handler catches them. Um, so then that might be something in what Jasmine's saying there, you know, it might be something in their energy. It might be something in the way they approach the horse that makes the horse more likely to leave. But they're they're really, really interesting things to explore. I think it's a it's a very important thing to do. Mm -hmm. I love this discussion. Thank you, Kate. And you know, just I'm just thinking now, like I'm just thinking about how we show up in every moment, and that there's that over for me, it's overused now. But that word mindfulness, it's actually like I'm over everyone throwing it around. But how do we show up, and in terms of how the horse receives us? Menka has come back and posted. Yep, I will definitely go into that. So thank you, Menka. Um, also, Becky's come up and said. I've read a, a recent paper, can't remember the author, but it said that the professional riders are more to likely to be, a, it's a man's game. So I think you're saying that the gender, there are more ma male as gender compared to leisure to am and amateurs. Yeah. Uh, and therefore more likely you'd send your horse to a professional who is coupled to being male. <laughs> I think that's how I've interpreted it, Becky. Correct me if I'm wrong. What you're saying is because me the, the, gen the men 
are in the profession, yeah. we don't get much choice. And that's why I think Kate's a breath of fresh air. Kate, can you tell us a bit more about how you've got into translating the science for all horse lovers, men and women? Yeah, well, I actually, um, somebody sort of pushed me towards Andrew McLean said, you should read this guy's stuff because he's talking about what you're talking about. And this was years ago. And um, I thought, okay, I will. And, and then I discovered um, that it's actually really hard to eat, um, to read anything that's um, behind a paywall. So anything that's not open access. So I then discovered Paul McGreevy and I wanted to read much more, but I couldn't. So I nicked off with my daughter's um, uni library access and I started to get right into it. And I read a paper that Andrew and Paul had written together about um, training techniques that uh, compromise welfare. And in there then they talked about another paper that was written the year before, which was about the round pen. It was called the round pen technique. and it. It wasn't a great study because the pen wasn't round and it, and all these sorts of things. It wasn't good. Um, and they had suggested um, that the round pen shouldn't really be used. And I got my back up about that because I think that any tool, when properly used, can, can be very good. And the round pen, you know, it's a good place to do all sorts of things. It's certainly a great, terrible place to chase horses around, but it's a good place to do all sorts of really good things. Um, and so I thought, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to write an article and, and um, tell them that they're wrong about that. And I discovered eh, Joe blogs on the street. Can't just write an article, apparently. Um, you, you need to have some qualifications to do that. So off I went back to university um, at the ripe old age, if I won't tell you what, and um, did an undergraduate degree in equine so science. For everyone watching, that's really inspiring because, you know, we all think that the, the moments passed us by. And can you hear me? <laughs> just go back and do it. <laughs> yeah, okay. I love that. You were very brave and you've just circled back and said, you know what, I am going to show up. So for everyone listening who I think, you know, if you're at a crossroads and you're thinking, I'm too old now to do what I love or to carry on, um, you know, the, actually, thank you for sharing that. You went back and you just showed up for you. So, you know, you removed the barriers that were there. Yeah, yeah. lots of clapping. So yeah, so I so I went back and did that, and then I um I applied to a PhD with the very person that inspired me to to want to go and write the article. So I ended up having both Paul McGreevy and Andrew McLean as supervisors on my PhD, um, and I wrote the paper with both of them. The three of us wrote a paper all about the round pen and how you can use it ethically, and and that was that was really great, and that was for me the the full circle. Um, yeah. Can I, I mean, I'm just, I've got a vision of this bridge and I feel like you've all just met on the bridge. Like, yeah, there's loads of claps and it's so, somebody else mentioned in the last session about togetherness. I actually feel like we, you've just shared with us your pushback when you felt that you heard something you didn't like. Oh my God, in today's society, everything's about polar opinions and yeah. to get our emotional reaction and how you, you sat in it you return to education and then you've just and i think it's recently successfully achieved your doctorate so your dr kate fenner and your supervisors were the two men who inspired the further investigation into yeah. what you know and who you are is that is that correct That's a, yeah absolutely yeah hit it on the head mm. wow okay. We've got some more, lots of claps, lots of love hearts. Here we go. Um, from Gail, previously I did training horses and um, once pleased with how horses were, were doing, but it was hard to give it back to the owner who contributed to the problem. Ah. Okay, now we're getting to horse training. So we've just migrated a little bit from your story. You are a translator of the science to application. We're now coming on to this whole when we are the problem, we're also the solution. And I think Gail's suggesting that, you know, how do you navigate that space, that bridge between training your the, our horses and then training people and for the two to fit back together again? Mm. I think, you know, for me, it's, it's all about the people, you know, because I have only, I can impact that animal's life while I'm with it. And then, 
it's over. But if I can change the person, then they, if they own the horse, they can impact the animal's life for the rest of its life. Um, and it's, it's wonder, it is wonderful taking horse in for training. It's great, but it's so much better watching the faces of people when you, when they do it themselves. Like I've got this really simple little lesson that I teach at the beginning of every clinic. It takes most horses five minutes max, and it, I call it hips to the fence, and you you teach the horse to come to the mounting block by clicking your fingers. So you stand on the mounting block, you click your fingers, and the horse moves its hips to you and waits quietly while you get on, right? And during that lesson, I just as a sort of byproduct, the horse learns to side pass on the ground, right? And it really does take five minutes. And the, the people's faces, just, wow, you know. And you can see, and they, even some of them say, oh, that horse must have known that already and stuff. And then 10 minutes later, the clinic starts and you get them all to teach it. And it's like, oh, my God. And suddenly they learn, actually, this is not that complicated. It's it's really quite simple. And, and I can do it. So it's really empowering for people to learn that they can actually change the behaviour of this big animal that they once thought was, you know, difficult or dangerous. And... Um, and I think that's, I suppose that's why I do it. I, I would love to just pause here uh, and just for us all to think about what you just shared. I'm thinking about how maybe your own equestrian communities have more spotlight on power over others. And what you just shared is power with others. And I think that with others is is the word we call empowerment. And, you know, I see you empowering horse lovers and I see you doing that through caring about the use of science, the use of evidence-based knowledge. I think you mentioned you might share something with us about um, reinforcements. Is that is this a good time? Or yeah, we talk a bit yeah why not? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an idea. So what I try and do is translate the translate the scientific language into practical things that people can actually go and do with their horse. So um, there's a lot of confusion about positive reinforcement um, and there's more confusion, I think, amongst the dog fraternity than there is even amongst the horse fraternity. But you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, I only use positive reinforcement and that negative reinforcement is bad. And I know there's been some studies done on this, but we basically still don't know enough about it, how it works, and we don't, as general, generally riders, understand it enough. And so I came up with a simplification. Let me just see. I know, Kate, also, I think we'd like to have a chat about language, and, you know, we can have a discussion shortly once, we, once you've shared about the use of negative and positive, which we know is mathematical, uh, in reinforcements, yeah. and then negative and positive welfare states. So mm. we can really we could dive into that. Over to you, Kay. I'll come off the stage. Actually, let me just come off the stage. Oh, you're all right. You're just on the side. I think. Oh. Anyway, yes, yeah. stay there. Don't leave me up here all by myself. I get lonely. Yeah. Um, okay. So if we think about just training anything, so we've got a spot on the horse we want to move which could be any part of the horse, but choose one. We've got a direction we want that to go. Any spot on the horse can move in six different directions. We need to motivate the horse to change that, um, to move that spot. And that could be your proximity, your voice, your leg, your seat and whip. And we want to reward the horse for doing that. So if someone says to you, I only use positive reinforcement. They're going spot, direction, reward. You can't, you've got nothing to motivate the horse with. The motivation section of this diagram is the negative reinforcement. It's the pressure release. And the pressure release is two things. It's, it's the same thing, pressure release. It's not pressure and then the release is the reward. The reward is extra. You stroke the horse on the neck or give the horse a rest or, or do something else. The, you, to motivate the horse, you use the pressure and the release. And so I find this really useful to just help explain to people. So whatever it is they want to teach, I say, okay, well, what's the spot you want to move? Can okay, we work that out? So if they're going to load it onto the trailer, the spot, you know, might be the left front foot. What's the direction? They, they want that to go forwards and they want it to go backwards. Well, how the, what are they going to do to motivate? Usually they'll tap the horse on the hip with the whip 
And how are they going to tell the horse that was the right thing? They'll scratch or stroke the horse and they'll rest the horse on the trailer. So I think that it just, it just really helps me explain anything that I'm teaching um, to break it down like that. And it's not intimidating, but the science is there, the science is behind it. And I think it's empowering for people to understand that science as well. Because I know, you know, if you if you realize you use pressure and then somebody on Facebook goes, oh, you can't do that. You can't use negative reinforcement. That's nasty, you know. Um, then you can sort of feel bad. What concerns me quite often is people who don't realize they're using negative reinforcement probably aren't releasing very well. Because if you don't know you're using pressure, how do you know when to release? Mm, that's such an important, important conversation to have. And I haven't quite opened this up all about equestrian content, um, but I do think what you're asking of us is to put a spotlight on how we are interacting with our horses and to have that knowledge. Shall we? Because mm. I, I love a hard conversation, Kate, okay? Let's do it. Let's go there. Let's talk about the, the sort of the pros and cons of changing language. Do we want to change from negative to removal reinforcement? And do we want to change positive reinforcement to additional reinforcement because of the 2020 five domains model? So like, the five domains talks about having this outcome of positive and negative welfare for horses. And that means language is all going topsy turvy. Yeah. What do you think? Mm. I agree. I agree. I think it's important. I think it's important that we change it um, so that people understand that that's what they're using. And people need to understand when you look at the, the five domains as well, you know, it's their choice of operant conditioning quadrant that dictates the welfare outcome at the end of the day. And a lot of people don't sort of understand the, the basics, which is, you know, if whether it's negative reinforcement or positive punishment. And, you know, a lot of people think, well, if I didn't hit the horse hard, it's negative reinforcement. It doesn't matter how hard you hit the horse, it's what was your intention. Were you intending to discourage the behaviour as positive punishment? Were you intending to increase the behaviour, then it's reinforcement of some kind. So, you know, it's it's not based on that. And what happens, and we talked, um, somebody was talking in the last one about, you know, how difficult it is. I can't remember what the, what the comment was. Uh, Good contact or something. There was some term that was a bit wishy-washy in, in dressage, and they were saying that makes it difficult because you can't measure it. Um, and you know, it, it's the same thing with correction and punishment. People feel it's not punishment because it's not severe, but it's only punishment um, when your intention is to discourage a behaviour. It doesn't matter if you're blowing at a raspberry; it's still punishment because that's when you um, applied it and that was your intention to discourage the horse from doing it again and it's important that people know that because what is severe to me might be very light to you and what is very light to you might be very severe to me we need to be talking about the same thing yeah why, well also why don't we talk about like even lightness i mean a fly is aversive to horses, I mean, we don't get to decide if a fly is aversive or not. The lightest touch of a fly and the horses are motivated to remove a fly because they're aversive. So I think this whole construct of what, I think it boils down to a comment we had in the first presentation, judgment. It boils mm. down, to, you know, we're parents, Kate, it's about everyone's got an opinion on how to bring up children, how to, you know, do they, do should we have got evidence-based knowledge in terms of making a behavior more or less likely in the future, but we all show up in our own learning history. So how we've been reinforced, our unique genetics and our current environment. And I find it really interesting, the diverse, and I enjoy, it enriches me, the diverse ways we show up to have these conversations. I would like us to explore the what would happen if we did migrate from the addition and removal 
in terms of the language, positive and negative, would that have a huge change on the on how horses feel humans? Or would we be going into a blurry mess of trying to explain with say dog trainers and dolphin trainers what we're actually doing? Yeah. Um I think it's a just changing the language, changing the terminology doesn't take away the problem with people not understanding it um it's not going to make it any easier to understand it's just going to make it a bit more palatable um so yeah i, I think there's a root problem there that ch a change in language isn't going to get around i mean and the problem is you know negative reinforcement or positive reinforcement in fact you know becomes a uh, positive punishment or negative punishment very quickly when it's poorly applied doesn't it? You know, if, you, yeah. if you're not timely with your treat, with your dolphin, it's it's negative punishment pretty quickly. Uh, okay, we're now in what I call the quadrant quandaries. And this is what, yeah. I, think, <laughs> this is what I think about humanness is we need to simplify and put constructs into boxes. But we know life is nuanced and complex and there's this genius of the and you talked about combined reinforcement this and why would we shut off the like why would we be the tyranny of the awe and have like it's positive reinforcement only like why one, not realistic but two even showing up in that construct is so lacking nuance and the, the the richness of diversity and i think that's probably what i'm trying to explore in international women's day is ebbing and flowing through our shades of different mm. within that evidence-based umbrella any thoughts yeah. on that kate yeah um i i agree i agree and you know it, it, it's all about collaboration we need to we need to combine and collaborate the thing about you know you can you can mostly use reinforcement it's a, it's impossible to only use positive reinforcement or to only use negative reinforcement. It's impossible. I mean, really, I mean, you could probably do just negative, but I mean, you'd have to never praise your horse, not rest your horse, not pat your horse. I mean, it'd be pretty hard um, never to use positive reinforcement. And, you know, it's it's the same really with the positive and negative punishment. They, they go together, these things. We When we use bits of all of them, mm -hmm. if, if we're honest with ourselves, and let's start there, um we use bits of all of them uh do you know what i think would be really interesting because i'm i'm up for experimenting if you are okay could we oh, break always. Out? always come on then let's do it because um i think we're quite together i think we quite enjoy challenging others it's about choose to challenge why don't we all invite all the delegates now to head to the lounge to take a seat at a table and actually have, and Kate and I will split up or join the tables and just have conversations around changing language or is there anything else that you'd like to direct us on, Kate? I would just thought it'd be quite useful for um, going to small Yeah, no, are we coming back? Yeah, so I'm thinking oh, it's half past time. We've got another 15 minutes. Should we spend yeah. five minutes on meeting others in this conference? And should yeah, we, I mean, I'll, I'll be specific, everybody, changing the language to fit the five domains. So positive is about having these emotional states that are making horses feel good. And positive in in terms of learning is about the addition because it also has. And I'll finish this point here. When you have a value judgment on the word positive and negative, it actually makes you quite righteous. And I mm. think something that really, when we're showing up as the student and not the knower, we can dismantle righteousness and we can start to get it right for horses rather than be right. So. Are you up for this, Kate? Um, yeah, great. I think.
if we let the delegates hop on the tables, we will ebb and flow. We, you and I can ebb and flow because we're the speakers. If you have any problems, just message me, Kate. All of you now, I want you to, I'm going to take a break. So that means we all go to the social lounge and we'll come back. I'll give us five minutes, I think, and just have meet with each other and have a chat. See you all in a minute. Oh. Bye. See you later. Best be seen, we're back. Very briefly, uh, I was. Go it was lovely to hear all the conversations. First and foremost, to see you all. You're there. You're talking, chatting. I love that. The next thing is the conversations you were having. I've made a note, and I'm going to actually blow this up in 2022. So International Women's Day, we are going to circle back to Yasmin. I, I think that's how I say your name. I will get it right by the end of today uh, on boundaries and women. And it came out of a conversation about using the word negative and um, how women are actually, we, how we show up maybe with less boundaries than the, are other than the male gender. And if that's the case, you know, one of the things that I've got my own freedom from is in the last two years, I've put in more boundaries in my own life, which has meant I can be way more generous. And I, mm. I can't tell you what a gift that's been for me. By having more boundaries, I have become way more giving. So I'm going to bring that into 2022. So thank you. Kate, what did you, what did your tea, what did your table talk about? Well, we, yeah, we basically thought that a better understanding of, um, what it is people are doing when they're training so how they're using the reinforcement or punishment um and also the need to to change the terminology a bit just to make it a little bit more user friendly um so to allow people to actually um put their head up and say yeah or with their hand up and say yes this is what i'm using i i teach my horse with pressure release reward combined reinforcement I think it might even, and Gillian was talking about this on our table, she was talking about how, it, you know, it might even free people up so that they can have meaningful conversations because there's no judgment, you know, like they yeah. can actually, that that could be huge. I mean, that that is behavioral change in itself. And also Gillian talked about how do we keep with the language that we've got just be, uh, uh, because um, there's always going to be pushback if it's something that, so if we're going against our confirmation bias or we're going against what we already want to hear. So if I want to hear more of what I do and now the language is changing so it confronts me, I'm going to push back anyway, whatever you change it to. Does that, does that make any sense? The yeah. human push yeah. on something mm. different or. So I think there was quite a lot of healthy discussion around this is not simple. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's it. I think we could probably summarise there, Kate. Would you like to sort of bring this to a bit of a closure about how, you know, you're, you are our translator. You're translating the science into meaning and practice. Is there anything you mm. want to sort of leave women joining us today with? Yeah, if I could. Um, so I basically started doing that here in Australia, but I've also um, wanted to just mention IPAN and um, if I could um the hillview hillview fund the oh yes well, our charity yeah. that oh yeah can i do that can i share my screen yeah. Yeah. Go um, for it. Okay. so i went i saw on um on a website i did a search um have you got that Um, okay, there we are. So yeah, so a couple of years ago, um, I I did this search and I was looking for a charity because I felt you know I really want to give back and I I don't know where to do it. I love India, and I just came across this charity that um, 
said that they were looking for a horse trainer. <laughs> I rang them up and I said, oh, I'm a horse trainer. And then so I went and spent a month with the Hillview Farm Animal Rescue and they've got horses out of um, circuses. They've got uh, 250 donkeys, I think 50 horses. They've got massive, masses of animals. That's just absolutely beautiful. And while I was there, I um, they took me to visit this tourist riding operation. Um, and it was, it was pretty scary um, for the welfare standards and things. And they were taking horses in India, the, they don't really put horses down. So when they finish racing, they basically just turn them out on the street. And a lot of them, um, you know, succumb to um, plastic, ingesting plastics and, you know, colic and that. So it's pretty awful. But one thing I noticed with the tourist operators was there were very few women with, there. And obviously there's big problems in India with um, <laughs> employment with women anyway. And so... I thought, you know, that is something that we could probably do is to um, help them by starting up a charity that would um, give um, to, to women who were working with those tourist riding horses and try and improve their welfare. And that's through the, um, the Hillview Farm Animal Refuge at the moment. There's, they've got the most beautiful place they run a pony club for the local um okay. riders and children it's I, wonderful i was getting confused you sent me this the information about hillview yep. i actually didn't yep. realize there was the women in tourism so i would like to make my corrections on our uh paying it forwards and I would like to make sure it's the women in tourism that I think really gets our attention so apologies for that I didn't quite understand yeah no, no that, that's probably my fault this is something that I'm I'm working on now so Hillview Farm is there it's established and I'm working with them uh, right. to try and get the white um, program up and running because of COVID I should have been there last year um, and we were going to be working on it. And I'm really waiting to visit until, you know, COVID is a bit more normal. Well, you've got, you've got all our support. This is a really great initiative. I love projects like this. And it really is about putting women at the centre of horse welfare. So let us, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up. We've, we've managed to, you've hit the all new high of, um, we've <laughs> actually got, I just saw, oh, we had 40 delegates, so down to 39. Please take 10 minutes now we're gonna have a quick break and you can go to the arena kate will you be at your booth for, for the next 10 yeah, minutes yeah sure i'll go to my booth and then you can have uh sit with take kate at the table she can chat to you at the table uh this is on her booth and um christina will be there i think as well for horses and people magazine sophie is also joining us now so off you go everyone head over to the arena thank you so much kate i love thank all the you. work you're doing keep being more kate and um thank you. thanks Bye. lisa